Welcome back to the Earth Keepers podcast. This season, I'm welcoming a series of thought-provoking guests to the show to discuss where exactly humanity is headed and how we can collectively create the future we'd like to see. What is the new Earth and how do we get there? I think it's going to take all of our ideas, visions, and inspired action to arrive at this unknown future timeline. So my hope is that this season inspires you to bring your own bit of magic into the world to help usher in what's next for us all. Before we get into this week's episode, if you're feeling inspired to go deeper and want to support the work it takes to bring this podcast to life, I'd love to have you join me in the Earth Tenders Academy. The Earth Tenders Academy is my online course and community where you can learn more about the history and energy of the community that you live in, hold space for the healing of humanity and nature, remember more about your specific gifts and role with the earth to see the true magic held in your everyday environment. I invite you to step into this portal with me and hundreds of other earth tenders from around the world. Tap the link in the show notes to learn more about the Earth Tenders Academy and join us in this beautiful community. And now on with the show. Today's guest is Sylvia V. Lindstedt. Sylvia is an author, scholar of ancient history, and wildlife tracker. Her work, both fiction and nonfiction, is rooted in the myth, ecology, feminism, and bioregionalism, and is devoted to broadening our human stories to include the voices of the living land. I worked with Sylvia a bit last summer as I was pulling all the threads of season three into a cohesive story, and have also participated in some of her writing workshops, which I can highly recommend if you'd like to find a way to weave your shamanic journey experiences into the written word. I just love the way she brings the ancient stories to life in our present lives. Now, if you're not yet familiar with Sylvia, I think the best place for us to start is for you to hear her tell a bit of a story that we'll be discussing during the interview. I've listened to many of her stories on her podcast, Calliope Sanctum, but for some reason, one story in particular has stuck with me since I first heard her tell it a year or two ago. It's called The Garden, and each time I've listened to it, I've heard another element that I hadn't heard before. It's a bit like a portal taking me to different destinations each time I hear it. Now, on the surface, it's about a man who stumbles across a garden while out on his daily walk. It seems like he should have noticed this garden before, since this is a path he's been walking every day for five years. But suddenly, on this day, it has seemingly appeared out of thin air. As he walks closer to the garden, it continues to be just a little bit further out of reach. When he finally arrives at the entrance of the garden, he's greeted by a dog, who telepathically welcomes him to this liminal space, asking him to leave his cares behind. Then he encounters some nature spirits, who seem to be the ones who tend to this garden before being shown some liminal moments in his own life, like the birth of his daughter, the death of his grandfather, and a most perfect moment from his childhood. And then the images from his own life turned instead to images of familiar stories and myths, some of what we might call creation stories. And so I encourage you to listen for the ones that are familiar to you now, as you hear Sylvia tell this part of the story of what the man encountered in the garden that day. These shades and sylphs of light among the tangled stalks and blooms became others. Not my own life, but another life, or many, and yet I knew them well and clearly. A slender woman with heavy hair, opening a carved box, and all the sorrow and need and pleasure I'd ever felt pouring out of it with a rush of pollen into the air. A man, in a hundred pieces, and his wife weeping, more beautiful than any woman I had ever seen, gathering his pieces up one by one into her arms, her dress dark as river silk. A man with a golden instrument in his lap, paddling a long, thin boat in a very dark place, turning back just once to look on the ashen face of his beloved and losing her there and the red poppies in the upper world where he returned. 
a man with a lantern inside the belly of a great whale singing a lovely girl falling and falling from a hole in the clouds to the earth far below which was only just being formed a woman in a garden speaking to a golden snake in an apple tree a hunter with his bow a pond full of beautiful long-necked women the shore lined with feathered skins a little box full of embers and a hummingbird darting away with one in his beak a young man following a ball of golden thread as it rolled across mountains a citadel a whole gleaming city of gold and silver and bronze at the edge of the sea at sunset and a woman in red opening the gates to an inexorable tide a great savanna and in the center a woman holding her newborn son up to the stars asking for one to fall into his heart so that he too might walk among lions an old wounded man and a young shining one in the cup between them and outside the land all wasted and dead for the question the boy did not ask the question that i now standing there among the bees knew with perfect clarity for one long instant but coming back fully to myself I could not recall it, and to this day, I cannot recall it still, though I have known it when I dream. So how many stories do you recognize? Certainly, if none of the others, you must be familiar with that collective story our current culture has been living under for the past 2,000 years. The one James McRae and I talked about in the last episode. A woman in a garden, speaking to a golden snake in an apple tree. That creation story belongs to Christianity. But what struck me in my latest listen to the story of the garden was just how many of these stories I knew, and how many more across thousands of years of human history and countless numbers of culture that I must not know. How many times we as humans have rewritten our story, our collective myth, where we came from, why we're here, where we go after our time on earth is done. Since Nietzsche proclaimed God is dead, we've been trying to find the actual, provable, scientific answer to these questions, yet somehow with all our technology and science, we don't seem to be any closer to the answer. So I asked ChatGPT to tell me where we came from and where we go after we die. After all, Artificial intelligence has instant access to the entirety of all documented human knowledge. As you might imagine, the AI informed me that, based on current scientific evidence, human evolution was the most widely accepted explanation for the origin of our species. That we emerged from our ape-like ancestors thousands of years ago to slowly become the humans we are today. And when it comes to our death, ChatGPT told me that it's important to recognize that the question of what happens after death remains unanswered from a scientific standpoint, as there is currently no empirical evidence to support any particular viewpoint. It said that the mystery of what lies beyond death continues to be a matter of personal faith, spirituality, and philosophical contemplation. So, right, nobody knows for sure, not even the AI. So maybe God isn't so dead after all. Humans need story. We need myth. We need someone to give us something to believe in, to explain our existence. Which brings us back to Sylvia's story with the man in the garden. I had wandered further into the garden without realizing, trying to get closer glimpses of these phantasms at once intimate and strange. Now the flowers engulfed me and the bees, chest high, as if I had waded into a lake of inexplicable phosphorescence. Great dark red blooms of perfect geometry, spires of mauve and yellow and rose, white umbrellas, nodding pollen, a profusion of fragrant orange pinwheels at my ankles, stumbling with dark and velvet bumblebees, the broad-hipped pear trees, a single cherry, the hedges of rose and raspberry. It was like being inside a single unbroken moment of creation, a rose opening, and also all of them at once, a beauty so sheer and so unmanageable that I felt myself trembling. I was close to terror. I feared that behind all of these bright petals I might actually glimpse the one who made them, though that force was simply a great light or a great shadow, 
an old and radiant man or a woman as broad as the earth or none of these or an unseeable crossroads of matter and spark it would destroy me where i stood it would undo me unmake me unspool the story of my life it is a beautiful idea that we might be able to grasp our origin the source of our creation in a garden perhaps that's why so many origin stories include a garden the perfection of nature reflecting the perfection of our own creation. Except in Sylvia's story, instead of a snake tempting the woman with a forbidden apple, a nature spirit offers the man a perfect pear. He takes the pear home and sets it on his desk, where it stays in its perfection, season after season, as the man becomes obsessed with learning all that he can about the sacred gardens of the world while never actually planting a garden of his own. And now I'll let Sylvia tell you the rest of the story. Instead, I sought the garden only in my mind. I might have gone mad if not for the golden pear that never diminished on my desk, and the memory of the feeling of that place. A place where neither regret nor worry touched, where time seemed to well from the blossom and tell itself in light and shadow every story that ever was all held inside a single one. Many years later, after we had become grandparents and a terrible war had come and gone from the world, my wife fell very ill. Then I thought with a great surge of hope that I understood at last what purpose I had saved the golden pear for all these years. I brought it to her with a little knife and bade her eat it, certain it would save her. But she only smiled and said, my beloved, I do not want eternal life. That is not for human beings. We have had more than our share of sweetness here. Now give it back to the world and me as well. She made me promise to clear a space and plant the golden pear in the earth. I could not bear to while she still lived in case she might after all decide to take a bite. But she was much wiser than I, my wife. After the funeral, I brought her ashes with me to the fir wood because I did not know what else to do. I was crazed with my sorrow. I brought the golden pear too. I went to the place I had so many years ago seen the garden. My frequent coming and going, seeking it, had cleared a path to that place which was still only an opening in the trees. Very gingerly, I began to dig a hole and then another. I brought a shovel. I cut the pear into three pieces, a seed in each. Inside, it was still wet and fragrant, dripping sweet as the day it had been picked. I buried each piece. I licked the juice from my hands without thinking. I spread my wife's ashes in each hole. Then I laid down on the cold ground over the three mounds I had made and wept, so many tears for an old man to weep. I wept violently and long, until my whole body hurt, and then I slept all through the spring night without stirring, dreaming of my wife when we were young, and our daughter a baby still. When I woke, I understood. I spoke to my wife, and the pear seeds, and the fir trees. In a shaft of early sun, I saw a figure, dark as earth, with gnarled hands and tender eyes. Then another, gleaming as with the dust of moths. But there was no garden yet around me that morning. I began to weep again. Then I began to dig. In the end, for all the man's reading and learning and dreaming and striving to get back to that beautiful place that was the source of all creation, he realized it was only possible through his own action. Although he had at first experienced this place spontaneously, with no effort on his part, it was no more than a vision, an idea. And the gift of the pair was the reminder that this place and time really did exist, somewhere. But to bring it to life in his timeline, it was going to take some action on his part. A vision is only that, until we give form to it in the here and now. And so... I hope you'll carry that idea with you through my conversation with Sylvia about myth and story. 
along with the power of grief to create something new from the ashes of what once was. What actions can you take in the here and now to begin writing a new creation story for this moment in time? What garden are you planting for our future? And with those questions in mind, I give you my conversation with novelist, poet, artist, scholar of ancient history, myth, and ecology, Sylvia V. Lindstedt. Right. Well, welcome, Sylvia, to the podcast. So happy to have you joining us. And just want to dive right into our discussion and really start with, you know, what drew you to the ancient stories, to the myths as a foundation for your own storytelling? Mm. Um, well, thank you for having me here, Amy. I'm thrilled to be having this conversation today. Um, and it's such a big, it's such a big question. It's kind of sitting with this beforehand um, because my impulse toward ancient stories and myths has been part of my life for so long that I couldn't even really trace it to begin with. And what I came to just thinking about it was actually, I think it's been an instinct since I was a little girl toward old stories, toward like, you know, the books that I was drawn to as a child, both, I think, especially once I was able to read longer books were always, almost always books that were based on an old myth or an old fairy tale. And I didn't, I didn't know that at the time. It's just what I was instinctively drawn to, like a, like an animal instinct, you know, like a hunger or a thirst. It was like, I need this to be part of this book that I'm reading. You know, the books that were offered to me that were about like life now, like kids in the world, you know, in like the 20th century back then in the nineties, like I was like, no, sorry. There's no sense of a speaking earth. There's no midwives who know the, you know, the lore of the herbs of the, their land. Like, what is this? I can't read this. I don't wanna read this. So that instinct was in me as from a really early age. Um, and it's just kind of been there all the way through, I think, as I kind of came into my own, with my own writing over the years. Um, I think I found that when I have a story and, you know, these myths and fairy tales, they're from the oral tradition, right? So when I have a story that I can, that feels like it's from that old lineage, it helps me orient my own writing it's like I need that I need to feel that root system in order to to write something good it's just it doesn't seem to be very good when I don't do that so and so I'm speaking of all of this you know as an instinctive knowing that I've had that's hard for me to explain why it's just like because it it feels right to my being it feels better it feels like it makes sense of more things in my world and in my soul and in my psyche when I write that way. So that, yeah, that's, that's my, those are my first thoughts in response to that question. And I've since like studied old stories and myths more deeply, but that's the kind of the, the origin point. Yeah. And I think you touch on something really important about your childhood and I know it went back far before that. I'm, I'm not sure when, the kind of myth and fairy tale and and stories became only for children right and really kind of mm. left our well they haven't left our collective consciousness because we we all know them um and and feel some kind of connection to them but it does feel like they're kind of missing from our day-to-day -day lives and i'm just mm. wondering what you think you know what are we missing from our culture when we don't kind of have some of those stories to root us in and connect us back to an old time. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I, um, I like, it's interesting what you're saying about how, you know, this movement toward relegating myths and fairy tales to the nursery, so to speak, to the nursery room. I'm not sure who it was who I've read or listened to speak about this, but um, somebody, in the last 10 years I've read saying, um, in a way this has protected the stories when they, you know, they're, they're protected within the, like the child's world. 
because okay. children still, um, you know, we're allowed to retain that the consciousness that under instinctively understands those landscapes and those ways of seeing the world as children. And that consciousness kind of holds the myths and fairy tales protected. Um, and, you know, kids kind of love even like the really like dark kind of scary, nasty parts of the fairy tales too. Like the more sanitized they are, the kind of less interesting they can be as a child. So just all of that is interesting how it's protected there. So that's just one thing I want to say, but, um, you know, again, like it's, it's a, it's an enormous, um, query and an important one. And I think two things are kind of coming to my mind at the top of my mind. One of them is the ways in which, um, you know, and fairy tales and myths, they, they hold different places in an inhuman psyche. Like myth involves much bigger, like cosmological story, origin stories of how we came to be, how people came to be who they are, like the big lineages of a culture, of a people, of their relationship to different um, parts of their ecosystem and of their, their homeland. And it, it can be quite cosmic myths. You know, they're, they're reaching like up to the cosmos and down deep into the underworld. And fairy tales are kind of more human scale. Um, both, I think, provide psychological roadmaps, like roadmaps for our psyches. This is the first thing I was gonna say, but fairy tales sometimes feel like they're a little bit more accessible in that way. Um, I feel like there are certain fairy tales that are things that I tend to turn toward in difficult moments in my own life. Like I think this is not true for just me, but a lot of other women, the handless maiden fairy tale, um, which is an Eastern European story has been really useful for me at many moments in my life because um, it kind of maps um, both like initiation as a human being, like growing from girlhood into womanhood for me it has, but also has been helpful in like difficult psychological times, you know, when I'm going through, through something in my own psyche. And of course, this is something that, you know, the Jungians like definitely are on board with in the way that myths and stories can hold these um, keys you know, to our own deeper understandings of our psyches and our soul. So there's that piece that I think is incredibly important. But then there's also, I think the piece that brings me even more alive and draws me to them, which I think, you know, the wonderful storyteller and myth carrier, Martin Shaw says the best that earth speaks in myth or earth thinks in myth. I think that's one of the most brilliant things to be said in the last like many decades about myth. That's just such a big, beautiful, important statement. And I think that's that sense that because these stories come through lineages of oral tradition, who knows how far back, right? Like passed on from grandmother to grandmother, granddaughter, grandmother, you know, grandfather to grand, whatever, like on and on and on back, um, back to a people whose daily lives and dr night dreams were much more infused with the consciousness of the earth around them just simply because people lived so much closer to it. There's like these communications that have come through stories, fairy tales and myths um, that are the earth speaking. That just, I just believe that, that just lands for me. And I think that if earth speaks in, you know, in fairy tales or in myths, then we desperately need to be paying more attention to them as a way of beginning to listen again, I think. Both, you know, learn, but also listen and hear better what the land, the lands around us are saying. Yeah, and it's interesting to me when you think about how stories sometimes have persisted across continents or... Mm. Um, across the you know, generations and they shift and they change even though you know the core story maybe is still there but it feels like the shifts and change oftentimes connect to the land like you're saying yeah and that you know what what changes is unique in a particular place for a particular group of people and mm. I just wonder what your sense is on how much of the storytelling is really the land 
telling stories through us. Mm. I love that question. And I think probably a lot more than we, you know, initially think, especially, I think it probably partly depends on how oriented one is toward listening, right? To the land that you're in. But in terms of historically speaking, you know, the story that came to my mind when you said that was Psyche and Eros and East of the Sun, West of the Moon or the Bear King Valamon, which are forms of the same story, but the one Psyche and Eros is Greek and it feels Greek, you know? And <clears throat> East of the Sun, West of the Moon or White King, Bear King Valamon is Northern European, Scandinavian. And it feels, you know, suddenly the, the, the animal husband who was this like serpent dragon turns into this big white bear. But many of the pieces of the story otherwise are similar. Um, so it's like that essential, um, like human nature seed of the story remains the same, but the land brings through its own voice in some of those details changing. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think, I just think, um, I guess when I write, that just tends to be what's happening, whether or not I realize that's what's happening, you know? Um, but I do think it is a matter of openness to it as well. Um, yeah, I think as you're saying, almost when you're in a place, if you're immersed in that way, I'm sure you can't help but notice what the animals are, or what the birds are, or what the plants are, and they would be unique to that place. Like the bear would be unique or specific to Scandinavia. And, and then that kind of locates the story for the listeners in a way that actually resonates, you know, in the animal body. Um, yeah, and this is, this is something that I did um, years and I guess it was about 10 years, God, 10 years ago now, my gray fox epistles. Were, I don't know, were you around for the gray fox epistle era? I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, so I sent out, I was retelling sort of fairy tales and myths that were, um, connected to my different ancestry. So I was, I was exploring this idea of how stories travel, um, trying to kind of use that to help myself root and orient more deeply to California, which is where my you know, family has settled over the last couple generations. Um, and so I, you know, I gathered together 13 different stories and wrote one each new moon and then sent out the stories in the mail to subscribers. But my idea was to see what happened when I brought you know, frog skin, a Russian fairy tale, for example, to California, or um, the Children of Lear, you know, an Irish story, or what else? Um, a lot of others, but it helped me. I felt like they could show me how to root here because they are, you know, indigenous to my blood in a way that the stories of California Indian people here are not. Like those would be kind of an easier roadmap in a certain way to understanding the cosmology of this landscape. But it felt like, you know, for so many reasons, not an appropriate path to take to orient to the kind of um, web of story and beings here. And so instead I was like, what, what happens to frog skin? You know, this, this woman becomes like a red-legged frog and suddenly this, which is a California endemic frog species, suddenly this story is teaching me about the ecology of this place and also opening itself in a different way, you know, by being here. And it just was a healing thing to do. And I love that so like, much. Yeah. Creatively, and, yeah. Oh, sorry. That's okay, yeah. Yeah, I, I just wonder like how much sometimes working with uh, these energies in this way keeps them alive in that more animist way when we think about you know a talking tree or the earth holding us mm -hmm. or you know some of these things that maybe we do lose after childhood if it's not something that we're connecting with and that you know what a beautiful experience to use story to do that in your own landscape now yeah and and you know my my landscape has also shifted over <laughs> the last years. It's like, I think I'm orienting to three different places specifically right now. 
So I'm just, I'm just home in California for the summer, but I'm living in Devon at the moment. And um, then Crete is like the other, you know, heartland that I've spent a lot of time learning. Um, but I just wanted to say to that question or to that point, like that when we feed the stories, we keep them alive. And I think this is true also for sacred places. Um, to have this memory of being actually, you know, it being in Crete, I'm thinking of a couple of places, but in Crete, like I was doing deep research into Minoan history there. So Bronze Age, um, pre-Hellenic culture in Crete and visiting lots of ruins and like, you know, the, the parts of the ruins that were sanctuaries that were the, the altar, you know, where um, various ancestral deities were being worshiped. And I did feel a good deal of connection in them, like in my own way. However, when I went to shrines that were still active, you know, that, and some of them probably did have lineages that went back straight to Minoan times, especially cave chapels that I found, you know, where there was a, a cave that had been in use since Minoan times. And now the Panagia, the Virgin Mary was in there. And so that energy of worship and of belief in her was still alive there. Whereas in some of these shrines that I would go to, the altar stones in Minoan ruins that had been buried underground for 3000 years and nobody had been to until an archeologist had uncovered them. While my storytelling self could feel a lot and read into a lot there, that like pulsing aliveness of, you know, a divinity or a deity or a like living force being present that was present much more so in these chapels because that you know worship and continual telling of the story was still happening even if it's in a christian form threads of you know the original mother mountain mother of minoan crete are still carried in you know the panagia and you know, without the stories being told in those places, they do, they do kind of wither and vanish and move elsewhere where the kind of the, the water of devotion is being poured on them still. I think they I like being example. loved and spoken to. Yeah. Yeah. I love that example. Cause that, that's really what I've come to over years of working with the land as well is that in so many cases, you know, we want to travel and connect with these known sacred places right and think well there's nothing in my own backyard nothing special here right mm -hmm. and it's really that it just hasn't been tended mm -hmm. and that through our devotion and our tending we can help the land remember as much as helping ourselves to remember mm -hmm. um in, in a way that would be unique and special to the place that we live and so what yeah. a what a perfect example of that mm, yeah Thank you. So you have a, a beautiful story on, on your podcast that I'm, I'm sure you remember, but called The Garden uh, that's in one of your past books. And it's just a really beautiful example of really a man who, uh, from my perception, kind of steps into another timeline, right, where he visits this magical garden and then spends a lot of time trying to figure out how to get back to it because it's mm. it's not there he doesn't see it it's um he's not sure where it came from or or how to get it back and it's really after a lot of obsession and i would say you know mind thinking and um whatnot that he really realizes that it has to come through his own creation right like the mm. through through action in that way and i just wonder how in our current times, how that can be a story for us to really um, see where we're going with humanity and with our own planet that, you know, it's it's easy for us to get caught up in our minds about what's possible or what's not possible, but never step into that mm -hmm. create creating mode. And so I just wonder how you see that story kind of in, in that lens. Yeah. Thank you for bringing up that story. It's, I had, I don't think about it that often actually. So it's lovely, it's lovely to hear about it. And it's in Our Lady of the Dark Country for anybody interested. Um, and it, 
it's one of those pieces of writing that kind of fell in like one day it just it, it was inspired by a combination of a Rilke poem um where there's this image of these like kind of what feel like little earth spirits tending the trees you know in the dark in the orchard and this like incredible fecundity and fertility that's always working out of sight you know that that's just the force that grows the fruit on the trees and then also actually inspired by a P.L. Travers essay in she's a wonderful well she wrote Mary Poppins but also a wonderful mythologist who in her book What the Bee Knows there's this passage where she writes about living like she writes about all the myths and fairy tales that she read and loved as a girl as this like living wash of story that's still living now around her and so that comes just to give context that was the combination that like this story those two things were in my head I'd been visiting a friend in Canada and this story just like fell in in a kind of divine way that doesn't happen that often where I just wrote it all like I would love for that to happen sometime soon again that has not happened in a while. <laughs> like, and I was kind of writing it like who is this guy what is this wow like this I don't know what this is but um and it's it's beautiful to revisit it right now and and just to to hear you reflect your own take on it because i hadn't i think that is that that you know those themes are the overall themes in it but something about the way you just said it that he gains access once to this this garden of life really this like garden of all possibility and i think of garden of the heart you know and of deep devotion and love and the fertility that comes from the life-giving, you know, fertility that comes from that place. Just by chance, kind of as I'm saying this, the way that a story just like, whoop, just popped in. I don't know what I did. And now I'm like, you know, um, like pulling my hair out for years over another book. And it's not, you know, falling in that way, right? Like that I'm, I'm coming from another kind of place with it, or it's just another kind of process. But um, it makes me well, what came to my mind actually was the Arthurian story of Parsifal and the Grail Castle. You know, the how Parsifal um, he enters the Grail Castle the first time, just like he stumbles in innocently, just like oh, okay, he didn't really do anything except just kind of wander along from his innocent heart and enter enter it. But because he isn't quite prepared for it, he doesn't ask the right questions of the Fisher King. And suddenly it vanishes around him and it takes him years to enter in again. And he's trying to enter through his mind and through his will and through his ego and through his achievements. And he can't find it until he um, surrenders again. And, and I'm bringing this back around because what came to me when you were saying that is that actually, you know, in the story, the way he finds the garden again, even though it is in himself that he finds it is through grief and through loss. And I think for Parsifal as well, he has to surrender so much of himself and I think of his ego and just give up and grieve and surrender back into love, you know, to be cracked open back into love. And then the way opens for him again. Suddenly, you know, the bridge, which he couldn't find and he traveled everywhere is just right there, just down the road. It had always been just down the road but he just hadn't been turned the right way in himself or in the world. And, you know, in this story too, like he, all this time, all he needed to do was be himself the gardener, not go banging on every door to find the garden again, you know? And so I think I kind of need to hear this right now, actually. It's like good to talk it through. I'm like, okay, thank you for asking this and bringing this up because this is good, a good food for my heart today. But um, I also think, you know, there's many um, brilliant cultural figures who speak to this at the moment about grief being an important doorway, I think, for us culturally because without passing through that like heart cracking open place we can't really I think we need to move through that in order to create from a place that's life-giving because in order to create from a place that's life-giving 
we need to feel the like immense love for life and preciousness of life. And at least for me, when I'm up in my head, as our whole culture is, you know, as our default, I also flee up there as a panic response, as a trauma response, as an avoidance of actually feeling things that are hard to feel. Um, but so long as I'm up there, I can't crack open and actually really create from that place. So it's like, first there's that need to sit with all the things that you don't want to have to feel, or at least as much of them as you can in a given moment in a way that feels safe, you know, and then from there, kind of see where love moves you. And then that's where the garden is planted. That's kind of how it happens in that story. And yeah, that's the path that I'm trying to follow that it's awfully hard, but on the other hand, the only one worth following to me. Yeah, and thank you for bringing in that that piece about grief because I think it is so important in this transitional place that we're in, where, whatever it is that if we can't feel our emotions about where we are and what we don't want in some cases, right? And what we, how do we find our way to what we do want and what we do want to create? So, yeah. and beautiful. I also think you know, ancestrally speaking. I think about this a lot just with my own ancestors coming from a lot of them from the British Isles and um, a lot of Jewish ancestors coming from different places in Europe. Just like how long there's been this fleeing from something that really was devastating. And I feel like I have enough safety in my lifetime now, you know, and enough emotional support and resources to actually begin to kind of open up that devastation. And I know you are doing similar work. And um, so I just think that's, that's a piece of what I mean when I say kind of sitting down and just like sitting with the part that's been frozen for generations and letting it just start to thaw generations or you know and from points in our lifetimes which are kind of connected right like the moments of freeze and pain that we have in our lifetimes I think kind of mirror what's happened before so yeah it's like the garden is on the other side and it's right here yeah yeah right right where we're looking and also not looking <laughs> just like right where it hurts right just like it's like sitting down right where it hurts that's where the that's where the garden is that's where you plant that rose I love that and really kind of along this the similar theme you know how do you feel that the storytellers of our generation really are helping to envision and weave the new world the place that we're headed where where is that kind of fitting into our collective conscious yeah it's um I think it's certainly a very important it's a central thing that we take seriously the power of story because we are story making creatures we are wired for story our lives you know are shaped by the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves you know in a very literal real right here way it's like you can kind of explore that idea just in terms of the story you tell yourself about yourself and how that affects your your day or your relationships or your self-concept or your well-being um and then of course we're also living within such damaging collective stories that i mean even down to the language itself you know i think about um indigenous languages and there's that beautiful essay in braiding sweetgrass by robin wall kimmerer about about this but many indigenous people you know have written beautiful things around just the orientation of language itself um for example not having not not making an it or a thing of 
everything that's not human. Just as one small example, when just a piece of our language changes so that, you know, animals and rivers and mountains and stones are ensouled, our beings are, you know, thems and theys and like ones who are subjects with us, not objects that we're acting upon. That shift alone could change so much in one's, in, in the consciousness of a culture. So our choice of language in that way on a, on a really kind of like um, nuts and bolts level is enormous as story makers and storytellers. And then, you know, I feel, I feel really hopeful seeing how many beautiful new, I, I don't want to say that they're new stories because I actually think they're new old stories. It's like, there's a, there's a movement toward like a huge opening that I see happening in the way people are writing about um, the earth, about a speaking earth, about a living earth, about our interconnection with the earth, about um, women's traditions, you know, that have so long been silenced. It's just like, there's a huge renaissance of speaking and storytelling around this that feels like it's already changing so much, even since I was, you know, a teenager. I can sense that happening. So it's such a big question that I don't, I'm not sure like how to answer it in a way because um, I think all we can really do is like follow our one thread. That's the thread that we are called to and to keep, you know, to keep coming back into the heart and the garden of the heart and checking where I'm, where, you know, where, what is the purpose of this, of these stories that I'm making? What is the place that this is coming from? What is the ripple that I hope that they have? And just keep following that with as much devotion and like um, honesty as I can and hoping that it kind of makes its, its, um, its healing ripple in the way that it's meant to because to kind of take on the whole cultural story like I, I mean I don't know like it's a scary you know we're in a scary moment too it's it's alarming it's an alarming it's an alarming moment and I think that it, it actually soothes me to feel like, I don't know that any, any of us can come up with a new story. I think that the, the way is already here and the, the earth speaks it, you know, and the heart speaks it. And we just have to remember to listen, maybe more than listen and create from the listening, more than thinking that we're going to like quickly, well, not quickly, but you know, that um, we can kind of take on such a big thing as cultural story making. Yeah, it almost feels like everybody's little, you know, piece of the story and thread is what weaves that new tapestry, right? Yeah. And then no one person is feeling the the weight of the world. <laughs> yeah, on, you know, on it's easy to feel story. the weight of the world. Yeah, <laughs> in term, in response to, you know, so much that we like so much knowledge and information that we have about the whole world now, which I think for us human animal beings is a lot to take in. So then we take on a lot more than we actually can handle. Yeah, it's so true. And, and really thinking about that, you realize you know, listening to the earth is, is such a subtle uh, conversation, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't shout and scream and hit us over the head like mm -hmm. you know a lot of the other information coming in um wants to do and, and same with like listening to our own self whether it you know be mm -hmm. our inner voice or our higher self or whatever I just think about how subtle and quiet all of that is and so how do you navigate really like the noise of the world as you're saying and mm -hmm. the the overwhelm of information to really mm -hmm. be able to connect with and tune into some of those quieter voices yeah that's beautifully said and such a good point and it's a hard one it can be it can be a hard one um because also because I think the way that we're consuming media right now speaking for myself you know a lot of a lot of social media happening um and it is meant to be addictive and so it's really, it's just an intense thing to notice in one's brain. 
that um, kind of breaking of the capacity to focus. I, I can sense a way that my focus is, has been broken or is being broken every time I engage really in any significant way as compared to what it was 10 years ago. Alarm me just on this. So I feel that I freeze. Froze. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that just as an aside, that alarms me about um, the addictiveness of it in our brains and kind of really having to look at that and consciously um, put some boundaries around it in order to be able to hear. I just noticed that I, if I don't do that, I don't hear very well because, you know, I, you do need to be quite quiet and have done a bit of work to um, yeah, like quiet the anxious mind basically. Um, although, you know, as I say that, what I notice and what's beautiful about this is that, you know, yesterday I was having a just an intense emotional morning, like just a lot moving around in me. I was, I could feel like it was, my brain was moving so fast and it was just, it was, it was really, it was not good. And I was like, okay, you know what? Drop everything. I know I feel like I have so much to do, so much to think, so much to figure out. I'm just going to go on the mountain here that I've hiked since I was a little girl and just sit down under a tree. And I was moving, my brain was moving so fast, but actually it didn't take long at all. Once I was there, just like take my shoes off, walk for a bit through the forest, breathe, listen, sit down. It's actually like 10 minutes really of just opening my senses and giving myself that space. And already I could feel my, my whole being shift. And, and it, when, what it made me think was that we are so wired we're so wired for all the voices of the land. Immediately, my whole nervous system changes when I'm hearing birds and I'm listening to birds actually, and I'm smelling the forest and I can feel my feet on the earth and I'm breathing differently. I'm taking in the air from the trees. Like it's my body knows that everything's better. It's like, okay. Oh God, thank God she's got us here. Like that took a lot to get her to just like get out the door. Okay. And, and from there, um, it's, it's like, it's what I'm trying to say is that it's as much noise as there is that quiet place is not as far away as we think in the same way as like the garden is not as far away as we think, you know, it's, it, you know, it's just like 10 to 15 minutes of some good breathing outside and you actually can hear again you know, but we can have so much resistance to that actually like fight and fight like a kid having a tantrum. I can feel that in myself when I'm in a certain kind of state, like I just fight it and fight it. And all I needed to do was breathe and come back to what is so essential in every one of us. That's the, I think that's an important thing to remember really is that it is our nature to be able to listen to the living earth. It's our, it's, it's, absolutely innate it's instinctive it's our birthright everybody can do it you know and um I think with our own inner voice it's similar but it's a bit harder I find that a bit harder because um there's more to wade through and there's like less trees to help me in there you know but <laughs> maybe, when we, maybe when we bring the garden inside actually I'm just kind of feeling into this as I say it, you can bring that, the, the outside inside, and it's the same. You know, that, that forest is inside as well, or the garden. We're going with the garden metaphor. I'm really yeah. into this. <laughs> it's, <laughs> really, perfect. it's great. It's working well. I'm yeah. always good with the garden yeah. metaphor. <laughs> yeah, it's going well. <laughs> oh, I was trying to think of where I was, what I was thinking, what, what, what that was bringing to mind when when you were talking about that, but I just realized even, you know, I've had moments before where that same thing where your mind is spinning and going and there's so much to do and there's not enough time to do it. And inevitably, if I stop and take a breath and say, how am I going to do all of this? Like the answer that usually comes in is go slower, right? I know. Like, 
And it's so annoying when that's not what you want to hear. <laughs> like, but there's so much to do. <laughs> no, I won't. I'm not going sober. I hate it. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, many people have said this before, but like, in terms of hearing that instinctive voice, it is always such a quiet one. You know, the, the one that's the intuition versus the anxiety speaking or what's something coming through from the land versus what I want to be hearing from the, what I think I'm hearing. The one is the instinctive intuitive one is so gentle and calm and quiet. You just like slow down. And, 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 you know, if you're like, no, I won't, then it's like, okay, well then don't. <laughs> <laughs> do it your way do it your way you'll, you'll come back to me though you'll find that that's right yeah, yeah I also wonder you know thinking about how in a ancestral way or really I mean ancient way how wired probably we are as humans to hear each other's stories or to you know listen to the stories of others but it would have been in such a small group right your own family group or um, mm -hmm. cultural group or whatnot and that there's it's almost like social media is like activating some piece of this of like everyone's story is coming at you right you're as you're swiping through reels or tiktok videos or whatever it's like everyone's telling you a story and you're like I have to I ought to listen to this story and like it's almost like you have to short circuit your brain to be like this story actually I don't need this story this is not yeah something wow. I have to take in <laughs> I think that's such a good point though that we are wired for wanting the story and yeah. wanting the community and wanting the community to hear your story right and so it 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 touches like such deep kind of tender like places of longing and of need and of connection and I think that's where it's really effective and really addictive and not that th not that there aren't good things about it but it's just something to really be aware of like you're saying you know it yeah you we cannot possibly be actually hearing I, I sometimes i i recognize i'm not hearing any of the stories right actually because <laughs> there's just too many so i just don't hear anything anymore yeah 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 i if somebody asked me a question about you know what did i what was that story I heard this morning at the end of the day? Like, could I retain the story or would it be gone? And yeah. along with the time and the energy and the attention that we, that we spent on it. So yeah, it's hard. I'm, I'm in the same boat. I, <laughs> We're, so we all are kind of. Yeah, you know, exactly. Like, right. <laughs> boat, like, what, hmm, what do we do in this boat? Yeah. Right. Right. Well, your latest book is called the Venus mm -hmm. year and I've talked about Venus before on this podcast as well. And you know, it's really something that has captivated humans uh, for many, many, many generations. So I'm just curious, you know, what is it that captivated you and uh, made you feel like you wanted to connect with yeah. Venus and its cycles in that way? Yeah. Well, I'm I'm excited just as an aside that you have spoken about Venus on your podcast, and I'm curious about that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so the Venus year, the book actually didn't like the name and the organizing principle around Venus actually came later to the process of writing. So um, originally I was just writing monthly short stories or poems um, starting when I went to Crete the first time in 2018. Um, after the end of my marriage and a long relationship. So this like really hard time in my life propelled me to go to Crete for, to research, to research this book about Minoan Crete that I'm in the final stages of birthing at the moment. And that was five years ago. So it's been a long process um, of research and just like dissolution and um, rebirthing parts of myself. But so I was writing, um, short stories and poems kind of just connected to my own experience in Crete about the land and also kind of listening like we were talking about, but in this case to Crete. And I had done this for about a year. Um, yeah, about a year when I suddenly realized this particular part of my life starting just around when I went to Crete the first time mapped onto Venus's, one of Venus's full 
19 month cycles. And I'm not really sure, I don't actually know like when those dots connected exactly, like what were the steps that led me to connecting those dots? But in any case, they connected and suddenly I was like, wait a minute, this is actually kind of uncanny. If I look at this cycle and map each of the months, um, because each month is her um, evening star phase and her morning star phase, and people talk about, astrologers talk about these phases in terms of um, vestments connecting the myth to Inanna's story, the Sumerian myth of Inanna's descent into the underworld and ascent up out of the underworld. Um, and it's like roughly eight months of um, stages where, sorry, I'm trying to like, <laughs> a lot to consolidate into like an explanation, but Inanna removes seven different garments as she descends into the underworld at each of these gates and then is hung on a hook in the underworld for a while. And it's really awful. And this, I've always like really not liked this story for that reason. And then she gains each of the things that she's taken off as she's ascending back out again. Um, and the myth of, so the, the, the myth of Inanna is said to possibly be actually just an explanation for Venus's cycle where each month as evening star, there's a moment where Venus and the crescent moon are together in the Western sky. And then each you know month in the morning star phase, it's the same, but in the Eastern sky. And you sort of see her ascending and descending in the sky this way. So suddenly I realized that this story timing with this Venus cycle was mapping exactly onto this period of my life of immense stripping away and dismemberment really I was like oh god that's why I've avoided this story my whole life here it is this is fun <laughs> I'm here in the underworld oh my god how long am I gonna be <laughs> and I feel like I've gone through a few of them like do I get to come out yet am I out have I been out, out. okay <laughs> Um, but this was kind of the first one that I was really conscious of, and it really helped me to hold this period of my life within Venus's movements. Um, and of course, Venus is the, you know, Roman name of the goddess of love, you know, of Aphrodite and Aphrodite and Nana Ishtar, you know, um, I feel like those, those are Aphrodite's older forms and faces and Nana and Ishtar and Aphrodite and then Venus. So this was a period of enormous heartbreak for me and enormous heart healing as well. And so it kind of just um, came together. I think the idea to even make the Venus year into a book was because I suddenly saw, oh, wow, this cycle has held me through this time and I've actually written pieces in this format for this amount of time. I'm gonna gather them to mark this Venus year in a kind of ritual way for myself. And so I gathered the, the stories and poems that I'd written. And then I also wrote like seasonal notes kind of at the beginning of each month. So it's like an almanac of this time, both a star almanac, a land almanac, and then also the interior world that came through the poems and the stories that I was, they're mostly pieces of Aegean, you know, mythic material that I was retelling. Um, and it was profoundly healing actually to just recognize that this planetary being, you know, was there helping me mark losses and rebirths and gifts and transformations. And um, I now am in kind of a constant relationship with where Venus is and where the moon is in relation to Venus. And I think that one of the most extraordinary things that happened actually, just to kind of finish this story of the Venus year that is so precious to me that it's almost hard to talk about still, what I discovered at the very end of finishing this book as I was going through like the fifth edit, you know, doing like final notes for my poor designer who kept having to do last minute changes, you know, it's like, <laughs> there's one more, I found something else. I happened upon this um, archeological paper 
by an archaeologist and an archaeoastronomer from the University of Athens and another university, um, talking about these sort of mysterious ceramic um, vessels from actually even pre-Minoan Aegean islands, so from the Cyclades mostly, um, but they found some in the north of Crete, like um, from like, let's say 2300 BC, so very, very early, that they've called frying pan vessels because nobody knows what they were. And they're these round vessels that often have two little feet, so it looks a little bit like a frying pan because it's flat on one side, and then the underside actually is a shallow vessel. But on the back side, they're carved with often eight pointed stars. Um, and then all these little dots, all these little dots everywhere. And the feet of many of them have a vulva shape at the top. So they were like, and they're buried with often high status Aegean women's burials. They're like, okay, it's something to do with fertility and women and wombs, but they're frying pans, whatever. Nobody knows what they are. So, th but these, these archeologists, um, meticulously studied them and found that over and over again, the number of dots corresponded with the 19 month cycle of Venus, 580 days of dots. Um, and then some of the other ones possibly corresponded with other planets that have similar cycles. So there's numbers on others that have to do with Mars, for example, but most of them have this Venus cycle literally mapped on them and were possibly um, tools to count the days of pregnancy and then like postpartum period as well. That was one theory that they were like, we don't really know what the counting was for, but clearly they were very sacred. Like they were counting Venus's cycle, but what was the other use? Why is it a vessel, right? Like what, you know, it's mysterious. I think it's possible they were scrying vessels. One side has the star map. The other side is this dark dish that could be held against the womb actually. That's my theory, but it was incredible to discover this and to find, okay, for reasons we don't fully know now, women were mapping this cycle 4,000 years ago. And it meant something really important to them because they brought it to their graves. So that just felt like it connected me in with this incredible lineage of meaning that made the book kind of feel like its own Venus vessel like that, it was my own version. So that was just a really precious thing that, that happened at the very end. And there's a little note at the end of the book about that with a drawing of one of them. So I just felt compelled to share that complex well, description. Thank you, because it, yeah. <laughs> it adds layers to my own understanding and, and whatnot as well. And I think, again, a perfect example of, you know, being in that space where you're able to hear and listen and pick up on some of these subtleties that really made a, a, you know, more of a meaning out of this period of time and the writing yeah. you're doing and, and, you know, that, that those things are there for us all and those cycles that we, that we go through in our lives sometimes totally unconsciously are, you know, we're still being held in that space. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting and I'll add a link for those who are listening that missed, um, the podcast where I was talking about Venus, but it connects to what you're saying as well. And that in my research in the last season with the Mormon church in particular, somehow or another, I came across this connection that really this, um, you know, father, son, and the Holy Ghost was really, to your point, you know, not a new story. And it was really mm -hmm. a much older reference to the sun, the moon, and Venus, and that and a much more matrilineal wow. society and culture. And there was, you know, long before Christianity, this that was the the holy trinity, right? And that was um that wow. connection. And so as you move forward in time, what you start seeing in a lot of churches is the sun, the moon, and Venus all reflected either in statue or painting or stained glass or all of these things. Mm. And it was carried forward as well into the Mormon church, which was really interesting because for such a um, patriarchal um, religion and church, it was like right here hiding in plain sight. And, and did they did they know that connection? Were they aware of it? But um, Or had it just been passed down so many times that it was just an icon that was yeah. incorporated of this very feminine 
uh, connection back to Venus. And mm. I just thought that was such a um, such an interesting connection and, and connects to the story as connection. well. Do you know which was, which, I mean, obviously the son is the father, but which is the son, the son, like Christ and the Holy Spirit, which is between Venus and the moon, do you know? Oh my goodness, I'd have to go back and look to be 100% certain, but I feel if I'm remembering right, it was, it felt more like this um, Holy Ghost piece only because that it's like the feminine is missing in the Holy Trinity, right, of Christianity. Like, of course it's mm -hmm. there, but it's not mentioned and it's not acknowledged yeah. as being the feminine. And so, um, so if I remember right, like that was the connection back with, um, back with Venus, but I would have to go back and, and yeah. look at my notes again. I'm excited to, to listen to that. And I just, um, what a profoundly beautiful thing almost to like re vivify in Christianity now, you know, to connect that to these great cycles of the sun and the moon and Venus around us, you know, that like to move back away from it being an icon that nobody remembers why the sun and the moon and Venus are there to like, oh, wow, this to combine those stories, you know, has such beautiful forward moving potential to me because the essence of the father, son, and the Holy spirit is such a beautiful thing. And I right. think combining that essence with the essence of this cosmic movement of deep feminine renewal, ungendered, just feminine renewal, you know, and darkness and renewal, like those things combined just like brings me more meaning to both. Does that make sense? That's just how it feels. Absolutely. To me. Like, and yeah. I, I think in today's day and age, a lot of people are looking for that reconciliation of like yeah. feeling a connection but feeling a brokenness in that connection. And so some of this, I think, helps us reorient to like this, this was a much older story. This is, you know, humans have been sitting and looking at the stars and tracking their movement and, and telling stories about the movement and what they mean for eons. For, for, yeah, forever. It's like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think this is also actually part of the new story making that you were asking about before is it's almost like dusting off the shards of things that have always been there, you know, inside of Christianity, inside of these old matrilineal um, knowings and, and cultures and dusting them off and being like, oh, actually, wait, this was here all along. This was here inside, hidden inside the Mormon church, but nobody was telling that story, but it's not like it wasn't there. Like, how can we see what's here and tell it new right right yeah. there was there was the honoring of that yeah um of the feminine as well just yeah you're right nobody told the story so I just thought it was yeah. a beautiful connection to to make and of course it's in many of the churches and many of the other religions it was just I can't even remember now how I came across and made that connection but I think I was looking at the uh the different uh, symbols and icons that were on the temples. And I realized, wait a minute, <laughs> this is, <laughs> this is much older. This has yes. been around a long, long time. <laughs> so, well, mm. to, you know, kind of bring our conversation back, back around here, I, you know, I've, I've done some of your um, writing workshops that, that you offer as well. And it always, to me, feels like really much more of a shamanic journey, right? Going on um, on a journey in the liminal realms to find other pieces of myself that I maybe mm -hmm. wasn't aware of or um, stories from the earth or mm -hmm. from my ancestors that, that want to be told. And so um, I just was hoping you would share a little bit about kind of that process for you, but also the importance for others who might be kind of on a journey like this or feeling like they want to share or write or tell stories um, of kind of the importance of being able to tap into those liminal realms to bring those stories through. Yeah. Um, my sorry, my little dog Runa just wanted to join. She was so cute. At the door, so she's here now. Um, little yeah, baby from the Venus here actually. Aww. 
So yeah, it's, I like what you said. I appreciate what you said about the writing classes and like, thank you for being there. And um, I think I, you know, I call them writing workshops because my way in is as a writer, but I recognize that if somebody's looking for like a writing craft workshop, that's not really what they are. And, you know, on the flip side, people who are nervous about writing don't need to be nervous because it's not really a writing workshop, like in the sense of like, we're not, you know, we're not going into line by line craft, you know, edits. I think the purpose of them, as I found, is to kind of demonstrate, to try to offer some of what my tapping into the imaginal realm or into my imagination is, into the living world is for me. And so each one of them is like a a way to access that place, which is both within us and also, you know, in the great everything. Um, so I've, I think I've heard other people say they feel kind of like shamanic journeys as well. Like, they're like, I don't know what you just did, but <laughs> where I just went, but it's, I have a, a friend who um, took them a while ago and she said, you know, the things I'm working on writing never really seem to move forward, but I have whole new ideas that come through. And that's really great. So that, that makes me happy just to, just to, to offer a space where you can access the part of you that new stories come to and, um, and just feel free there to remember that it's a joyful place to create from and that, and a beautiful place. Um, in terms of, yeah, so you were asking about if people are wanting to write or express more in that way, like what, how I might offer guidance. Is that what you were asking? I feel like. Yeah, or like what the importance of kind of being in that, uh, in that liminal space yeah. is for telling stories. Yeah, I think, well, I think, you know, there's a couple of things. One, like in a way it's about accessing the flow state which you know, people talk about in all different creative fields that um, it's, it feels like I slightly hypnotize myself in order to, what, or rather when I have slightly hypnotized myself in the way that I think we kind of do in the classes in a totally not scary way. You know, we just do a little meditation, right? And then hear some poems and get guided in. But it's only from there that writing that feels really, true and that it's coming not just from me comes out and whenever it's coming just from me only Sylvia's brain it's not very good and I think that's true for all of us right all writers this is true for and um you know it's like it's like the garden story all over again what we were talking about in that conversation but um you know so there's bringing ourselves into that deep free place of imagination and Kind of mythic time or mythic consciousness where maybe a poem and the images in a poem and the rhythm in a poem have brought you into that place in yourself that feels like you know the eternal wellspring that's where you can flow from and let just like let the creative spirit kind of move whatever is in you out and at the same time i think if you want to be writing from a place that's like tapped into the living world around you to the earth, to place. I think you have to be writing from this place or creating from this place because that's where, um, you know, the trees around you or the birds, you know, that you've seen that day or the hill that you've walked on, that's where they have room to come in too. I think if you haven't opened that space up like a, and allowed yourself to be in broader consciousness and deeper consciousness in yourself, yeah, those, those voices don't necessarily come through. Yeah, it's so beautiful yeah. to think about and, and it hadn't occurred to me until I had asked the question, but I thought, you know, traditionally shamans were the storytellers of a group, right? And mm. they were the ones that were in the liminal realms and were in touch with the other than human realm and bringing through. So it seems only natural that in going to that state into that flow space that the stories would have would have flowed through oh, through yeah and it's um i think just in speaking to that also it's important to 
also know how to close that door and come back out of that space and ground out of that place because, and you know, I am speaking from a place of actively like being obsessed with writing about the earth and myth, right? But this goes for all artists, whether or not that's what you're doing actively, you're still opening to something bigger than yourself when you create and when you write. And I think it's why, you know, it can be a dangerous thing to do as well. And you need to take it seriously and be careful too. You know, I've had this intense burnout or spinning out, or, you know, you can see why, why people who go to those places throughout time have turned to addictions and, you know, various, like a lot of alcohol, et cetera, because it's big to open that place. So it's just good to open and then close it again, you know, and learn how to leave and come back and be here too, you know, not to be scary at the end here, but just- No, but it's such like a great reminder. Because otherwise you us, can go a little crazy. Yeah, any of us who, you know, have a shamanic journey practice know like that you come back from the journey and you make sure you're back in your body and you may, you know, you have steps that you follow to get back to, I guess what we would call ordinary reality, yeah, right? Just, and that otherwise you can feel very ungrounded or not connected and, and yeah, open to, you know, all of these things and other realms that um, maybe we're not consciously paying attention to that we would be if we were in, in that yeah. space. So yeah, it's, it's just an important reminder as writers or painters or, you know, um, musicians as well. Even if you don't know what a shamanic practice even is. Right. It's good to realize you're kind of doing it. Right. And point taken for myself, because I realize when I'm writing often, you know, my solo episodes and I'm in, because I am, I'm in that space and I'm writing, like, I can't, I don't want to stop the flow. Right. So suddenly the whole day is gone and I haven't eaten and I haven't gone to the bathroom and I haven't, <laughs> right? like, yeah. I haven't moved because I don't want to interrupt the flow. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And that's great. I mean, that's beautiful if that happens, but it's just like, come back at some point, you know, but you still have to, come it, yeah. yeah. Just even and when you sleep. do, you're like, wow, yeah. I'm hungry. Yeah. I know. Like how long have I, my feet are completely asleep. And like, right. yeah. yeah, I totally understand. Well, thank you so much for sharing your experiences yeah. and your stories and your wisdom with us here today. Can you share? I'm sure people are going to want to connect with you. So where, where can they find you and your writing and your work? Yeah. Thank you, Amy. This has been a great, like just um, inspiring conversation, actually and nourishing. So thank you, first of all. Um, and in terms of my work, so uh, there's my website, just are you gonna have that would be a place to link it but yes I will add, yeah, I'll have yeah and then so that's where you can kind of okay sorry that's where you can find all my books and you know past work um links to all that and um also my sub stack the pollen basket is kind of where my newest just thoughts and writings um are shared there's also my podcast calliope sanctum which is where amy is talking about the garden that's on that podcast and the um it's from the book our lady of the dark country um and i think that's about it in terms of you'll find me there and yeah all the all the books etc well thank you so much again and i look forward to reading more of your mm -hmm. of your writing going forward thank you amy Thank you to Sylvia for sharing her thoughts and stories with us here today. I hope it has planted seeds of a new vision in your heart and your mind. If you enjoyed this episode and you think these ideas are worth spreading, I really hope you'll share it with others. In the meantime, thanks for listening and thanks for being here on the earth at this moment in time. I'll see you back here next week.